Please help me welcome Mr. Bill Will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Dr. Cruz, tell said that we're real proud of him and we think he's kicking butt and we're going to push him as hard as we possibly can. I just love that man. He's a good, good boy. Thank you, sir. Well, David really nailed it, you know. Um, Andrew Breitbart was right. Politics is downstream of culture. We think that the problem lies in Washington, but that's really the end of the train. The problem really lies in Hollywood. That's really where the problem is. And if we don't understand that, then we've got some thinking to do. Uh, Barack Obama is not the cause of this country's problems. He's a symptom of the country's problems. He's an in inevitable result of a population that has become a certain way and has adopted a certain number of worldviews. And those worldviews weren't put there by Democratic Party platform programs or pamphlets or websites or anything else. They were put there by the pop culture. If we don't understand the power of story to screw up this country, we won't be able to understand the power of story to save the country. So before we get into some of the details on what's actually happening out there with these charlatans, losers, weenies, control freaks, and other forms of tyrants and, and, and malcontents, then we're going to have to look at how this thing got started. So I want to mostly talk about, not about the economy, because that would put everybody to sleep, and I'd be the first one. But I want to talk about what an economy is, but before we do that, I do want to tell you just a little bit, give you some idea of how much the pop culture influences everything. It influences us and we don't even know it. But I'm about to show you just how strong that influence is. Let's say that I'm a Democratic Party operative, and let's say that I represent a guy who has no particular talent, never really accomplished anything, certainly is a lazy individual, never really hard work or anything. All I've really done is hand out forms in old Chicago, let's say. <laughs> and let's say that I want you to vote for this guy. Well, if I was able to start a sentence like a campaign slogan or a policy position, and you could finish the sentence, then we'd know that you and I had a pretty good connection going, right? If I could start a sentence, and I could count on everybody in this room to finish the sentence, then you would have to agree that this guy's got a pretty good handle on the voting population and pretty much has them any way he wants them. So I'm going to start a couple of sentences, and you can finish them for me to show you the power of the pop culture. Ready? Here we go. We'll do three different ones just to show you that these apply over all different kinds of age groups. So we'll start with the first one. I'll start a sentence, you guys finish it for me. Ready? Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's Superman. Okay, you didn't have to go to the Superman website. You didn't, have to, you didn't have to pull out your pamphlets and see what Superman's position is. If I can say, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, and you can finish it Superman, then that's because you've seen Superman, the TV show mostly, or comic books or the movies or whatever. And everything that you know about Superman is in the back of your head along with look up in the sky. If you can finish the sentence, it means that you know who Superman is and what he believes. What does Superman believe in? He believes in three things. He believes in truth. Justice. See, I own you. I own you. I start a sentence, I know how you're going to finish it. I know what you're going to say. So if, if the fact that you know that Superman stands for truth, justice, and the American way, and if you can finish, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. If that's in your head, and it is, then everything else about Superman is in your head too. Namely, that Superman is an all-powerful being, he is essentially a god on the earth, who could in fact conquer the entire planet if he wants to. Superman could be king of planet earth without a moment's hesitation, and the only thing that stops Superman is Superman's own internal decency. His own internal decency, which he got from Smallville, Ohio, Growing up with Mr. and Mrs. Kent, put the decency and the self-control and the virtue into Superman's heart, and the reason he's not dictator of the earth is because he was raised in small-town America. Superman is America. America conquered the earth any time we wanted to since the Second World War. We had fleets of bombers, and we had eight bombs, and we had a, a navy at the end of World War II that had 33 aircraft carriers in it. Could have done that if we wanted to, and we didn't. Superman is America. So. If you believed in Superman, if you listened to Superman, everything you believe about America came into your head along with Superman. Now, we'll go to a little bit younger age group. I'll start a sentence, you finish it for me. Ready? Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. Aboard this tiny ship. That's a theme from Gilligan's Island. Not very political, really. All you really get out of Gilligan's Island is, you know, if you want to get off the island, all you have to do is kill Gilligan, you'll be off next week. <laughs> but, 
We do have some young people here, not too many, but we have some young people here. So I'm going to do something for the young people. Ready? Finish it up for me, guys. I know you can do it. It seems today that all you see is violence in movies and sex on TV, which is the opening theme for Family Guy. Now, Family Guy is a cartoon put out by Seth MacFarlane. And Seth MacFarlane is a big bag with Bernie Sanders, and he thinks Bernie Sanders is just swell. And everything that Seth MacFarlane believes, which is that America is an evil place, that capitalism is wrong, that socialism is good, that businessmen are evil, that religion especially is evil, Everything that Seth MacFarlane believes goes into every single episode of Family Guy and it's broadcast into the minds of every young people, every young person in this country and those people over there can finish that sentence because they've watched 100 episodes of Family Guy and I have two and all of that poison and that entire view of America is in your children's heads whether they know it or like it or not. Even the good kids can finish this sentence. It's in there, it's in their heads, and it affects their decision-making ability, and that's why we're in the trouble. That's why we have Barack Obama. Not because he had a particularly cool campaign slogan or a particularly interesting set of programs. The country was prepared for Barack Obama long before Barack Obama got here, and was prepared for him through the pop culture. It was prepared for somebody. It didn't have to be him, it had to be somebody. Now, we may think that political messaging in pop culture has to be kind of overtly political, but it's not. Just about any major movie's got an interesting political message, and I'll tell you what I think one of the most political movies ever made was. It's A Wonderful Life. Yeah. Which doesn't seem to have a speck of politics in it, right? It's A Wonderful Life is a profoundly political movie, and it's a profoundly political movie about the America that we believe in. And the reason I say that is this. What's the story of It's a Wonderful Life? Everybody knows It's a Wonderful Life, right? Jimmy Stewart, he's going to commit suicide, he wants to be famous, he wants to be rich, and he's got a big problem with his savings and loan, and there's money missing, and they're going to come and investigate it, they're going to close the bank, and he's on a bridge on Christmas Eve, and he's going to jump, and ding, 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 an angel comes down from heaven and stops him. Well, just that is very political, just that. An angel's appeared to save his life. Just that alone today is a pretty political statement. But what's really much more interesting is this. George Bailey, the character he plays, is a banker, he's a financial guy, and he lives in a town called Bedford Falls. And Bedford Falls is a terrific place. It's a wonderful, decent place, everybody's more or less happy, everybody more or less gets along. It's a good, loving, kind place to be. Now, when George Bailey is taken out of Bedford Falls, when that angel, Clarence, shows him what life would be if he had committed suicide, what happens to Bedford Falls? Well, the drugstore is replaced with a strip joint, and, and it's not even called Bedford Falls anymore. It's called Potterville, and it's run by a rapacious banker and an evil financier and all that other stuff. What's that movie really saying? Well, what It's a Wonderful Life is really saying is that America is Bedford Falls, and America is a good place. And the reason it's a good place is because it has good people in it. This man, George Bailey, is a person of absolute virtue. He's a decent, kind, honest man. And he's what makes Bedford Fall a good place. America is a good place because of the good people. But if you take the virtue out of Bedford Falls, yeah, yeah. then America becomes an artificially evil place. It reverts to Potterville, but that's not its natural state. It doesn't want to be Potterville. It's only Potterville when you take the goodness out. And at the end of the movie, when you put the goodness back in, George Bailey goes home, and the townspeople cough up their own money to make up the shortfall, then George Bailey realizes he's the richest man in all of Bedford Falls, and everybody cries. I see it every Christmas, I cry every Christmas, because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That's the vision of America that many of us grew up with. That's the vision of America that Hollywood used to pump out. But that's not the vision of America that they pump out today. In today's America, America's an evil place. And the hero today, the hero of modern movies, and it's almost always, it's almost always George Clooney or Matt Damon, Modern movies are about how an American anti-hero wakes up to the fact that what he thought was a good country is in fact evil. Because of some rich guy with a pharmaceutical company, or some rich guy who's doing financial speculation, or some rich guy who's got something or other, is doing all this stuff under the table. And the modern hero is the person who wakes up and tells everybody else just how awful we are and how sinful these money people are, and how, oh my God, all we have to do is just wake up and end this horrible living nightmare called America. That's what Hollywood makes today. And 
Since people go to movies, they've come to accept that vision of America today. And now we get into economics because if the bad guy in every single movie that Hollywood puts out is a rich fat cat who's taken more than his fair share, then taking his money isn't what it would appear to be on the surface, which is stealing. Since he got it illegally and since it's all evil and since we stole it from the Indians and because of slavery and all the rest of this stuff, if we're going to take money away from people, it's not stealing, it's justice. Right? It's justice. They didn't win it fairly. They didn't get it fairly. They stole it. So, by taking it back, that's justice. See? See? See how wonderful we are? I'm Bernie Sanders. I'm here to take $93 of every $100 you make. And see what a good man I am? See how much justice I'm committing here by taking this money away from those evil people that stole it all? It's good and evil. It's all it is. And if we don't understand this, then we're never going to win another election again. We cannot trot out charts, we cannot chart out programs, we cannot chart out policies when they are arguing good and evil. And the reason we shouldn't be winning this fight, the reason we should be cleaning these people's clocks is, it is about good and evil, and we happen to be good. So, why don't we start arguing our own now? So, Let's talk about money. Let's talk about economics. And I'm not going to bore you with M1 and M2 and velocity and, and the interest rate, all that nonsense, because it's not about that. I want to talk about what wealth is. I want to talk about what money is. What does it mean? What is it? What is property? Nobody has these conversations. So let's start with the fundamentals. I believe in private property and a free market. Why do I believe in these things? I believe in them because they do a lot of good for people, but I believe in them because they are morally they are morally sound, good policies. And I'm about to show you why. We take this so much for granted in this country. There's so much that we take for granted. We don't look at anything in the bare bones. But we're going to look at some things today. So let's start. As it turns out, coming up on October 25th will be the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Agincourt, which is big British victory at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War. And Shakespeare wrote about it with the Band of Brothers speech in Henry V. Coming up in another week or so, it's going to be 600 years ago. So, let's start with this. When the Battle of Agincourt was won, and they asked what the casualties were for the British, Henry V was able to report, well, our casualties were the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, and 300 good governors. Well, what about those 350 other guys? Weren't they just as real as the Duke of York and the Earl of Suffolk? Did they not have lives like everybody else? Did they not have families and children? Did they not make an impression on everybody else? No, our casualties were the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, the 350 unnamed, faceless cat and fodder, cat and fodder that literally belonged to the king. These people belonged to the king. The lands that they farmed belonged to the king. It was king's property. It's like saying, well, we lost the uh, Duke of York, we lost the Earl of Suffolk, and we lost 350 oxen, or we lost 350 crossbows, or whatever other property that the king happened to have at the time. That's why they didn't have names. The United States of America was invented so that individuals would have a place to live on planet Earth. Period. And we don't appreciate the fact that prior to the invention of the United States of America, which is a product of the Enlightenment, there was no such thing as an individual common person. They didn't exist. You were the king's property. And everything that you had belonged to the king, or the duke, or the earl, or the sultan, or the pasha, or the priest, or whatever, whatever it happened to be. But it belonged to somebody else. It was their stuff. You didn't farm your own land. You farmed the king's land. He'd let you farm his land in exchange for eight of the things that you made would go to the king and two might go to you. Good bargain for you, huh? But America was founded on the radical, radical idea that common people had their own lives and were determined to live their own lives. And maybe, God only knows, after working an entire lifetime, maybe they got to keep a few rewards of their own life. So let's start there. Property is a token of the work that you have done over the course of your life. Money is irrelevant. Money is just an exchange. Money can be a dollar, it can be a, a digital zero or a one, it can be a shiny rock, it can be a pebble, it can be a seashell, it doesn't matter. Money is not what I'm talking about here. Because when you work for a living, when you put in a hundred hours of work or a year of work or ten years of work, people give you money but they're giving you money in exchange for the work that you've done. 
And when you take that money and you buy something, and it doesn't matter what it is, that piece of property, whether it's a house or a car or a hoodie, is your condensed work token. It's what you've decided to do with the blood and sweat of your body and the efforts of your brain. It is all of your entire life concentrated into things that you own, and you decided what those things are going to be. Nobody tells you what kind of car to drive in this country, although they're trying to tell us in California, and the answer is it's a Prius, and Prius is your little toy cars from where we used to drive around. I'll point out, I'll point out that James Bond, James Bond does not leave the scene of crime in a big action movie. He does not drive off in a Prius at a reasonable speed. He drives off in a Jaguar at 150 miles an hour. That's the way men leave the scene of a big action scene. But I digress. So look, whether you own a skyscraper or whether you own a hoodie, if you have private property, what you are essentially saying is, I have something that does not belong to the king or the state. This is mine. It's mine. Mine. I pick the color, I pick the shape, it's mine. We have some poor people out there who maybe, they've got a total $150 in the world, they spend $149.95 on a hoodie. And you know what? Put aside the responsibility, that's their business. Whatever they want to spend it on, I'm not here to tell them what to spend it on, I don't care. I want them to spend it on what makes them happy. But property is not just something that came down by a parachute from the sky. It's something that you had to work for and work hard for for a long period of time. So when somebody is coming to take your property, they're coming to take away your entire life right. of work. Right. They don't own it. It's not theirs. It doesn't belong to them. But they're trying to convince you that they can by making you evil for owning it in the first place. Because if you're evil for owning it, then it's justice. And if you're not, it's stealing it. So property is simply a condensation of the work that you've done in your life and the hours of the toil and the sweat that you put into it, and that's what you've decided to purchase, and that's why private property is a defense against tyranny. Because it doesn't belong to the king, it belongs to you. That is a radical idea. It never existed before this country. It's yours. Well, who are you? Are you the Earl of Suffolk? No. I'm just a guy from California, and this is my car. Yeah. It's mine. I own it. I worked hard for it, now it's mine, and I like it a lot. So, this is the first thing we have to understand when they start coming for our property. They're not coming for something that was given to us by the government. They're not coming by something that was made by other people or other people's work. It's our work, and they're trying to take it from us. So now we have to really start talking about, well, what is an economy? And how does all this stuff work? And what is the moral justification for people taking your stuff? Now, folks, this is really simple. It's really much simpler than you think it is. Because when you get into all of the differences between liberals and conservatives, all of the difference between the Republican Party platform and the Democratic Party platform, it all comes down to, when it's all said and done, it comes down to one single issue. There's one single thing that divides these two policies and parties. It's the wedge upon which everything else breaks, and it's very, very simple, although no one ever says it. And the difference between liberals and conservatives is this. Do you believe that wealth can be generated out of thin air, yes or no? Yes or no? Now, if you do not believe that wealth can be generated out of thin air, then probably you're a liberal, because when you listen to liberals talk, they talk about the country as if it was a giant pot of money, but it's a fixed pot of money. And so they talk about redistributing the pie. And they start saying things like, you see that guy with that $20 million corporate jet? What has he done? He's taken more than his fair share, right? If he's got a $20 million jet, the progressives believe, since there's only a limited amount of money, that $20 million jet means that the $20 million that went spent on that jet didn't go to somebody's health care or somebody's college fund or some, some neonatal care for some poor mother. Some guy took more than his fair share out of a limited pot of money, and therefore, he's kind of a criminal. He's not a criminal, he's certainly a jerk. He had no right to take more than his fair share of this limited amount of money, so put it back. Don't you worry, we'll just take it from him, and we'll put it back, and if you vote for me, I'll just keep doing this. I'll give you parts of his jet back, because he took more than his fair share, because money is limited. Because it's a limited pie, and all we have to do is make sure the pie is cut up into nice even slices, same size for everybody. That's what the progressives believe, that you cannot generate wealth out of thin air. However, if you can, in fact, generate new wealth, then people like me say, you don't have to make the pie slices smaller. How many pies do you want? You want more pies? We can make more pies, make more pies so the cow come home. That's what America does, is big pies. You want more wealth? How much more wealth do you want? We'll just make it. 
Because if you believe that wealth can be generated out of thin air, that guy who's got a $20 million jet, he doesn't get to keep 100% of the profits of this company. The only reason he's got a $20 million jet is because his company has made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of wealth for everybody, which they voluntarily give him money for. Nobody's got a gun to their heads making him buy Procter & Gamble. No one's got a gun at your head making you go to McDonald's. No one's got a gun at your head making you shop at Walmart. So if this guy's got $20 million, it's because he's generated so much extra wealth for everybody that he's able to take some of that reward as a jet. So which one is it? Can wealth be generated from thin air, yes or no? Yeah. Well, I came out here from Los Angeles yesterday. If you get online and you Google, just look for Los Angeles 18, uh, I think it's 1865. You'll see a picture of Los Angeles in the year 1865. It's two Adobe huts, it's a hitching post, it's a donkey, and it's a wooden cart. And I flew over Los Angeles coming here yesterday, and it has improved significantly since then. <laughs> so, so, if wealth cannot be created out of thin air, where did all the Mercedes Benzes come from? And where did all the MRI machines come from? And where did all these glass elevators come from? Where did the flat screen TVs come from? And where did those cell phones come from? And where did all this other stuff, the air conditioning units, where did all this stuff come from? Did we go overseas and steal it from Africa? Did we, did we ship it up from the jungles of Bolivia? Did the Marines go and hijack the stuff out of Mongolia? No. Of course wealth can be generated out of thin air. Why do you think that the richest Americans 100 years ago, the richest American on the earth 100, 120 years ago, might, if he was really showing off, show up at an event in a horse drawn by eight, a carriage drawn by eight horses, but I get out to the 7-Eleven, and my carriage has 306 horses, and I'm really happy with every single one of them, and I'm just a regular guy. Why is it that the richest Americans 100 years ago never could have had any access to air conditioning or antibiotics, but the poorest American in the country today has access to air conditioning and antibiotics? It's because we've gotten much, 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 much richer, and that's because we've generated wealth out of thin air. And since we can generate wealth out of thin air, the people that generate the wealth are not the bad guys, they're the good guys. They're the guys that made everybody richer, everybody happier, everybody more secure. They didn't take more than their share, fair share, they made more than their fair share. Now, the question is, when you talk to people about generating wealth out of thin air, they just don't know how it happens. It's very hard to, for them to understand it. There's actually three primary ways you can generate wealth out of thin air, and I'll show you all three. The first one is the easiest one of all. If I take a pen, if I go down to Kinko's or an office supply store, and I get a legal pad and a pen, I spend $3 on materials, right? But if I sit there, and through the course of my uh, imagination and hard work, I write a screenplay for Fast and Furious 18 or whatever we're up to now, and I sell it to Hollywood for a million dollars, I've generated a million dollars worth of wealth because people will work harder than they need to to have a little bit of extra money to go and see Fast and Furious 18. That script is worth a million dollars because it's going to bring in $50 million. I have taken $3 worth of materials and just through the creativity in my mind, I've created a million dollars of wealth that wasn't there before I came along. And it doesn't have to be that romantic. You could take $10 of, of, of paints and, and canvas and make a painting worth $50 or $5,000 or $50,000 or $500,000 depending on how much talent you have. And this seems very simple, seems very artistic. But the truth of it is, most of the spontaneous creativity, the spontaneous generation of wealth, isn't in the arts at all. Because you could sit there with that same $3 legal pad and pen, and you could write out a business plan for a dry cleaning store. Let's say your neighborhood has got some really crummy dry cleaning, and the clothes come back frayed, and they're not pressed well, and you don't like it. You figure, well, it's not just me. I bet everybody in this neighborhood feels the same way. And sitting a couple doors down from your house is an abandoned lot. And you say to yourself, you know what, I'm tired of getting crummy dry cleaning. What would it take for me to start my own dry cleaning company? What would I need? And then the wheels start turning. Because it's not just dream about it, see? People dreamed about stuff all the time in the Soviet Union, but no one could do anything about it. you got to actually do it. That's the hard part. So I get my legal pen on my pad, and I think, oh, what's it going to take? Well, I'm going to need this much property. It's going to cost this much to develop the thing. I've got these kind of machines. I probably can hire my nephew, so I don't have to worry too much about this kind of property. You know, start laying all this stuff out. And nowadays, unfortunately, now you have to figure in how much money is it going to take for all the regulations? How much is it going to take for all the compliance? Oh my God, dear God, please, 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 do not let them dig up an Indian arrowhead on my lot because if one stone arrowhead turns up, I'm going to have to pay a million dollars to get somebody to come in and certify that this isn't some ancient burial ground, you know? So please, just have there be dirt there. 
But frankly, by sitting there with three dollars worth of materials, you can come up with a business plan for a dry cleaning business, and you can create wealth out of thin air because you're providing a service that wasn't there before, and that was an empty lot. Now it's Bill's dry cleaning. Look at that, and Bill's dry cleaning is doing really well. I'm going to put another one on the other side, of Little Rock, and that's doing big business too. I'm going to extend this franchise throughout Little Rock. Next thing you know, I've got dry cleaning stores all throughout the South, and I've got a twenty million dollar jet because I took more than my fair share. No, no, I didn't. Before I came along, everybody had crummy dry cleaning, but now the dry cleaning is better, faster, and cheaper. Everybody lives better. I'm out of here. I'm in my jet. I'm going back to Mountain. <laughs> See, all it works is nothing to it. It's nothing to it. It used to be automatic in this country, but they're making it harder and harder and harder to do because the people that want to take your money are the people that are too stupid or too lazy or both to be able to do this simple thing. That's why they want your money, because they can't make their own. They can't make their own. They don't know how. And they know they don't know how. That's why they hate you so much. So, invention. Just sheer creativity is one way you can generate wealth out of thin air. One way you can generate wealth out of thin air, this was a hard one for me, is by adding complexity to something. I won't spend much time on this because it's not very romantic, but it is interesting. The worst job I ever had in my life I got when I first moved to LA. When I got out there, I, I signed up at a temp agency. I had no money at all and I just needed some income. So I was signed up at a temp agency and they took me to an insurance company. They took me up on the third floor of, uh, I forget the name of the insurance company, and they marched me back where all the cubicles were and I kept going in the back, and that's back where they kept the animals back there, and then back where they kept the prisoners, and even further back in the dungeon. And up against this back wall, and this, I was 100 yards from the nearest person, was this concrete block wall and a desk and a shelf. And up on the shelf were these two notebooks of printer paper. Remember that green and white computer printer with the sprockets on the side? An envelope, a, a, a notebook of printouts about that wide and about that thick, and another one over here. And the woman said to me, your job is to do this. These are a list of all the people who have filed complaints with our insurance agency, and this is a list of all the checks that we cut in response to those complaints, and I need you to go through this one by one, take the person who's filed the name, and find their check that was issued, and check it off, saying that check that they had been paid. And I turned to this woman and I said, I, I can't do this. So the boy part of your job to understand is, well, I understand it completely well, but I just can't do it because my head's going to explode. And I just couldn't do it. And I'm a little ashamed of that because it wasn't very professional, but I'll tell you one thing. That was 25 years ago, and I thought for the longest time, why would that company pay me $7 an hour and pay the temp agency $15 an hour for me to do this? Companies don't pay for nothing. There's got to be a reason why they wanted me to do it. And I realized... But the reason is, is that a cross-checked list is more valuable than an unchecked list. I was actually generating wealth for that company even though I didn't know it. And the reason I was generating wealth for this company by doing this horrific, mindless thing of checking these two lists is, to, is because if they're going to pay me $12 an hour, or me 7 to make sure that these people got paid, that means they don't have to pay a manager to do it at $100 an hour when somebody didn't get their check. And it also means that since somebody is checking up on this stuff at $12 an hour, that person is not getting so angry now that they drop this insurance company, which is going to cost them 50 grand or 100 grand or 200 grand or 500 grand. So it's in the interest of the company for me to do this horrible, mindless job because an alphabetized list is worth more than an unalphabetized list. It's more valuable. I generated just a little bit of our national product and wealth by doing this horrible, boring, simple job of checking this thing and increasing its complexity just a little bit. But the fun one, the real one, is trade. Trade is everything and nobody understands it, because trade is a by God everyday miracle. So, here's a couple of quick questions for you. Let's say you go to the McDonald's and you've got 250 and you go through the drive-thru line and you buy a half meal. And you give them your 250, they give you the hamburger, the drink, and the little toy, and you drive off and they stay there. And the big question is, which one of you goes away as the winner? Both of you go away. Both of you go away as the winners because McDonald's has hamburgers and they'd rather have the money and you've got some money and you'd rather have a hamburger. You both go away richer as a result of this transaction. And if it didn't work that way, there would be no trade, there'd be no skyscrapers, there'd be no chandeliers, there'd be nothing. Both sides win. When I trade what I have for what I want, I come away richer and presumably that person does too. And so if this actually generates wealth, I'm going to show you exactly how it makes actual wealth, then the more of this that we can do, the richer we're all going to be. And the more I stop this process with these nonsense regulations and these nonsense restrictions, the poorer we all get, all of us together. So 
In order to understand how trade generates wealth that wasn't there before, we have to take the economy down to its bare bones simplest so that we can all understand it, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back before the founding, we're going to go back before the Romans, we're going to go back before the Egyptians, we're going to go back to caveman days at the beginning of an economy, and I'll show you how you can make wealth out of thin air. So, 100,000 years ago, we've got these hunter tribes, and they live up in the mountains, and the mountains are mountainous. That's why they call them the mountains. And up in the mountains, there is no place where they can farm for food, and there's not a lot of gathering, so the hunter tribe up there in the mountains makes their living by hunting. That's what they do. They hunt animals. And since all they do is hunt animals, the tools for hunting are things that they have to be good at or else they're going to die. So the hunting tribe is terrific at making spears. They make super strong spears. They've had generations of experience making these stone spearheads. They lash it on with these beautiful little you know, things based on sinew, and they carve little things in the, in the shaft of the spear. And they can throw that spear a long distance. You can bring down a mammoth with a spear made by these people, because that's all they do is make spears. They make terrific spears. They don't do much gathering up there, however, so their baskets look like a bird's nest, because they don't make a lot of baskets, and they don't know how. they got great spears and crummy baskets. Now, down by the seashore down there are a group of blonde people, and they live by gathering. There are no big animals down there. They have to gather berries, they have to find things on the beach, they have to catch fish occasionally. Because they're gatherers, their baskets will hold water. You can carry water in their baskets, they're so tightly woven. But their spears are junk, it's just a stick that they throw to fish, and more often than not, it just breaks in half. So far, so good. One day, a guy from the mountain tribe meets a guy from the ocean tribe in the Midlands. And through a series of grunts and, and clicks and whistles, the first thing he do is, oh, 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 these two individual people are facing each other, and the hunter guy says, essentially through a series of grunts and whistles, Sir, I must tell you, in all honesty, sir, seriously, that is without exception the finest basket I've ever laid my eyes on. And the guy from the blonde tribe says, well, allow me to retort. What a magnificent spear you have. Our company has never seen the likes of the spear. It is absolutely spectacular and magnificent. And then these two geniuses get together and say, I'll tell you what, I will trade you one of my excellent spears for one of your terrific baskets. And they do. And they both go back to their tribes, and the million dollar question is, which one of them goes back richer? Both of them! Both of them! Both of them! Both of them! Both of them are richer. Both of them. Because they both go back home with things that they didn't have before. They went home with things that there were not in their village before. This little basket, which may not seem much to you, but a perfectly woven basket in a group of people that don't know how to make a basket, is a sign of incredible wealth. And we all know what's going to happen when he goes home. This young guy's going to walk through the town with this basket over his head like this, and everybody's going to come out of their caves and go, oh, look at that basket. This guy's not an idiot. He's going to say something like, it is a very fine basket, and you single ladies out there might be interested to know that there'll be a private show of the basket in my cave as the moon rises over the lake so that you can come in for a private screening of the basket. We can have to arrange that a little bit later on. And people are going to be willing to trade the little shiny pebbles that they use for money for that basket because nobody has one of these awesome baskets. The pebbles are the money. I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking about the wealth. Now, if that guy is a Democrat, a proto-Democrat, what he'll do is he'll put that basket on a big rock in the back of his cave and he will show it off to people and then his children will show it off to people and then the basket's going to return to dust and that will be the end of his wealth. But if he's a Republican... <laughs> If he's a Republican, with his brand new basket sitting there, and everybody wanting it, and him being the envy of the entire village, if he's a Republican, what he will do is as he goes to bed that night, he'll say, now let me think about this for a second. I need five, I need three spears a week. I break three spears a week in my hunting. I need to make three spears a week, that's what I always make. But, if I get up early tomorrow, earlier than I normally would, and then if I come home after my regular day of hunting and I stay later than I normally would, I probably could make an extra spear. I could certainly do it in 10 days, certainly. And if I do it throughout the entire week, I could probably make two. I probably make, if I really stayed up late, I could make three extra spears. And then it dawns on him, he says to himself, turns to his wife and says, Honey, our daughter's not going to starve to death after all. I could have my idiot son-in-law come in, and he can make spears under my supervision. And the next thing you know, 
we're in business. And this guy takes the extra spears. Now, this is where the wealth is generated, right? The wealth is generated by this guy saying, I want the reward. I'm going to do more work than I would normally have to do to get more reward. I'm going to stay up later. I'm going to get up earlier. I need to make three spears. I have to do that. But I can make five. And instead of sitting around on the rock looking at the, at the pebbles at the rest of these losers, I'm going to make the extra spears in the morning and the evening, and I'm going to take these three extra spears at the end of the week, and I'm going to pray to God that somewhere down there is a Republican in that other tribe too, and he does. And it turns out that guy's making extra baskets. Now the guy comes back with three extra baskets, right? And that tribe down there has three extra spears, right? And again, I have to keep asking this question because this is where the liberals lose their minds. <laughs> Who loses here? No. no one loses here. No one loses. Everybody in the hunter tribe is better off because now they've got baskets that they never ever could have even imagined, let alone made. Everybody in the gatherer tribe has spears that they never could have imagined, let alone made. And the more trading we do, the cheaper the cost gets on each basket. If you've got the only basket in the village, that's worth something, but if there's 30 of them in the village, then they're worth a little less, right? The more trading we do, the lower the cost gets for everybody else. Now, the liberals have a problem here, because the guy that came up with this idea has got a bunch of the shiny little pebbles that they use for money in that village. Yes, he's got more pebbles than other people do. He does. And the guy who made the extra baskets has got more seashells than the other people in that village. But that entire village has spears they didn't have before. That entire village has, has baskets that they didn't have before. But they can't see that, you see? All they see is, how come that guy's got all this shiny rocks? How come that guy has all the seashells? Well, he has all the rocks because he did all the work. That's why. And if you want to get up early and make your own spear and go trade for it and walk the extra day to go down and trade, you can do it too. But they don't. But they don't. All they do is see the little collection of shiny rocks and say, he shouldn't have that much. He took more than his fair share. And that guy should say, hey, you remember before I came along and all we had were these crap baskets? Remember those days? Remember? But we're so far from that, we don't realize it. These people are heroes. They're heroes. They make life better for everybody. Better for everybody in that tribe, better for everybody in that tribe. That tribe doesn't win at the expense of that tribe and vice versa. Everybody goes out, everybody wins. And every time you make a trade for what you want versus what you have, a little bit of wealth is created. And we have 300 million people who prior to this administration used to be able to make these transactions every single time, all the time. But they're not going to let that happen anymore. Now they want regulations, they want more taxes, they want more of your, they want more of your stuff. They want your shiny rocks. They didn't make anything. They can't make it. Our society is divided into the makers and the takers. Which one are you? We know which one you are. The reason you're here is because you're a maker. And you don't like people taking stuff at gunpoint. Because it's stealing. Yeah. That's what it is. So now let's talk, now we understand how this works, now let's talk about the shame and disgrace that has overcome this country, if for no other reason than the fact that just, um, just a few days ago, there was a debate with, a, with the party of Jefferson, with a man who is an open socialist who is calling for taking 93 out of the 100 spears that you make. He thinks he's entitled to 93 of the 100 spears that you get up early and stay up late to make. 93 of them out of 100. And he's on stage where he's showing his face in public. <laughs> it's amazing to me that he's actually showing his face in public with this kind of larceny behind him and this kind of murder, by the way. So let's have a little talk about our socialist friends from across the aisle. They're murderers and they're thieves. Let's just start right there. They use the moral argument, I'll use it too. They're murderers and they're thieves. Everywhere that socialism has been put into place in this earth, the best case scenario is absolute flat line of no invention and no kind of economic activity. That's the best case scenario, that's sweet. More often than not, they're likely to kill a few hundred, two hundred million people. Right? And they'll say, well, no, 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 that's communism, that's not the same thing. Well, you know what, I didn't name them. I didn't name the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They didn't name them. Right. And I didn't name the German, uh, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. I didn't name them either, the Nazis. They named themselves right. socialists. Right. The reason they named themselves socialists is because it's got a nice ring to it. Mm -hmm. It sounds friendly and it sounds lovely. They named themselves socialists because they come in saying, we want you to just give you free health care, we just want to help you. <laughs> Next thing you know, everybody's working for them. And if you don't agree, then you're a wrecker or saboteur, and you go to a concentration camp where you get shot mad. Probably 200 million people. 
200 million people. That's, is that 2,000 Super Bowls full of people? Isn't it, isn't it really something like that? No, it's more than that. I mean, 100,000 people in a Super Bowl. They're just taken out and shot. Why? Well, because the system's not working. It must be somebody's fault. It's your fault. They need a demon. In the case of the Soviet Union, it was the Kulaks. You know what the Kulaks were in Russia? They killed between 8 and 30 million of them. Nobody really knows. But a Kulak was a peasant, just a peasant, who was a successful peasant, and maybe because he was good at farming, he may have had an oxen or something, or maybe he hired one other guy. Those people were the rich, fat cat, one percenters of the Soviet Union, and they were simply exterminated because they had so much. There's a great Russian joke that's the essence of socialism about a, a Russian peasant who gets on his knees and prays to God, prays to God every morning and every day for an oxen so that he can run his fields. And finally, there's a burst of light one morning, and an ox shows up. And now this guy's got an ox, and now he's plowing five times, 20 times the field he could have prayed before. And his neighbor across the street suddenly gets down on his knees every day for day after day and prays to God, prays to God, prays to God. And finally, the skies open up, and God appears before this peasant and says, what do you want? And the guy says, I want you to kill that guy's ox. Right? That's socialism in a nutshell. You're successful? No. No, you're making us look bad. No, kill his ox. Because I don't want to get up early and work harder than everybody else. I'm very lucky. As a young man, I had two friends growing up, and they cured me of any of the socialist thinking, and one of them came from Cuba, and the other one came from Bulgaria. And uh, let me tell you what I learned from these guys. The guy from Bulgaria was a poet and a writer, and because he was a writer and a poet and a successful one, he got access to Western libraries. He found out how people really live when they're left alone to be free. And he said, I can't live here anymore, and he got on a train without a passport, jumped off of a moving train, true story, and somewhere just outside of Austria on the border, he was lying flat on his face on a moonless night, and he saw the cigarette of the guard about 20 yards away, just marching across the field. That guy had been sent out there with orders to shoot and kill this guy on sight for leaving the workers' paradise. Shoot him dead. Of course you have to shoot him dead. You can't have people going around talking about these kind of things. And of course we have many, I grew up in Miami, I had many Cuban immigrant friends from Miami. So let me tell you something about socialism before we get into the details of guys like Bernie Sanders. Let me tell you something that's never happened in the history of this country. It has never once happened, not once ever, where a dentist went down to the streets of Fort Lauderdale with his family and took a couple of lounge chairs and inner tubes and wrapped them together with duct tape and inflated them with a hand pump and then put his aged grandmother on that, on that lounge chair and his little baby girl and his young wife and his 10-year-old son and he never once, not ever once, as he pushed off from the beach in South, in, in South Florida to sail south to get to the free health care in Cuba. That's never once happened. Never. It's never once happened. Not one time. Sounds funny, but it's not. It's deadly serious. People like Bernie Sanders will say, oh, I'm a socialist, well, I'm a capitalist. Well, you have an opinion, I have an opinion. These aren't opinions anymore, okay? I've been to Guantanamo Bay twice. I've flown over the Straits of Cuba from 30,000 feet and 90 miles of open water is a lot of water, okay? Hundreds of thousands of people have made the choice to come from Cuba to get to freedom, and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or more, left those shores and never got here. So you have to ask yourself a question. You look at the people at your table, just look at other human faces around you, because it's not an entire family. Seriously, just look at the people around you and decide whether or not you'd be willing to get on a raft made out of lawn chairs and inner tubes and shove off through 90 miles of shark-infested water. What would make you take that kind of risk? What would make you take that kind of risk? What would make you take the kind of risk where you watch your grandmother slip out of that chair and disappear beneath the waves? or your little two-year-old daughter be torn apart by sharks in front of your eyes. We have to get down to brass tacks here, because people make this decision every single day. No one ever got shot climbing over the Berlin Wall to get into East Berlin. This isn't an opinion anymore. This is what people do when their lives depend on it. This is not my opinion. It's a fact. And, if I was going to be a complete jerk about it, I could say, hey, you know what, if we stood over the Straits of Florida in a balloon, let's say, and 60% of the rafts were coming this way and 40% were going that way, we'd have a better system than they do. But it's not 60-40, and it's not 90-10, and it's not 95-5, and it's not 99-9, 99-1 rather. 100% of the people who risk their lives to go from one system to another, to go from Bernie Sanders' system to go to Ted Cruz's system, 100% of those people go that way. None of them go that way, not when their lives depend on it. That's data. That's data. Well, look, I can talk about 
Bernie all day. But again, Bernie's just no. Barack, right? Bernie and Barack symptoms are the same problem. When all of your movies are designed to make the bad guy the businessman, when the big reveal at the end of this spy thriller is some American businessman is trying to take over the oil from peaceful Middle Eastern country, or some American businessman is going to try and out new pharmaceuticals on people in Uganda without their knowledge, or some American businessman is going to blow up something and make money radioactive to raise the value of the Krugerrand, or some other nonsense like that. When you hear this again and again and again and again and again, you end up with the situation we have today. I made it abundantly clear that free trade is free. If you don't like McDonald's, don't go to McDonald's. McDonald's doesn't have a squad of guys with guns pointing at your head, making them go spend money. People in voluntary trade have to persuade you to give up your money by offering you better service. And the one thing I learned from my Cuban friend and my Bulgarian friend is what life under socialism really is. And it really comes down to this. They said that, yes, of course, you're afraid of the secret police. Yes, of course, you're afraid of the fact that you can just be taken away and beaten up or imprisoned or killed. That never leaves your mind. Everybody lives in a state of fear in these countries. But they said the main thing was that just every single day, hundreds of times a day, you're reminded of just how valueless you are as a human being, just how worthless you are as an individual person. You know, little old ladies in their 80s and 90s in Moscow during the days of the Soviet Union had to stand outside, outside, in line, in winter, at 40 degrees below zero for five hours to get into the store only to find out that there's nothing for sale. Five hour wait for food every day. What are you? You're nothing. This attitude is so pervasive in socialist countries that when they put the first McDonald's into Moscow, this is before the Soviet Union fell, I want to say this mid to late 80s, and they put the first McDonald's into Moscow, and the guy from McDonald's went over there to show them how to run this store. And what he was running into was they were moving so slowly, and they were so surly to their customers. It would just take them 25 minutes to get a burger order up there, and they were insulting people. Ah, what are you? And the guy said, you can't treat your customers that way. What the hell's the matter with you? And this one Russian guy actually said this. He said, we can do what we want. We have the hamburgers. Right? We have the hamburgers. That's what the state-run economy is. We got the hamburgers, too bad for you. Wait your turn. I'm not great. I can't talk to you now. I got things to do. I've got my girlfriend on the phone. I don't want to serve your burgers. We got the burgers, you don't. You have to wait. Tough luck. But when that whole system falls apart, the reason that whole falls apart is because I've got a McDonald's with a guy that says, we don't have to serve you. We've got the hamburgers. And now a burger deal opens across the street. Now they're serving hamburgers like that. Now somebody else has the hamburgers. Right? And now you have a choice. Now you don't have to stand in line for five hours because somebody's providing better service for less money. I think I'll go over there. They're trying to destroy all of this. All of it. And they're succeeding. And we can't let that happen. Right. Now, the final thing I want to say about this idea, because they will argue, their entire argument is, we are coming to steal the money that you've earned, but we're doing it to help the poor and the disadvantaged. So ultimately, we're good people. We've already made you into bad people, but we're doing it to help the poor. That's why we're stealing your money. Hillary Clinton wrote a book called It Takes a Village. And what is she arguing in It Takes a Village? She's saying that it takes a village to raise a single child. So that's something two parents can do on their own, for God's sake, no, no. It takes all of us, it takes a village to raise a child. What naturally flows out of this philosophy? Well, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village chief, too, doesn't it? Guess who she has in mind? You'll never guess! <laughs> Who's going to be the village chief in this world where it takes a village? Guess who? Yes! Imagine! And Fidel comes out of the woods in Cuba, and he talks about the poor people, and next thing you know, he's living in a palace for 70 years, right? He lives in a palace for 70 years. And Lenin comes out of nowhere, he's a failed intellectual, and he leads this revolution for the people, and he lives in a palace for the rest of his life. And all of these socialist swine who come to power, they all have their own cars, their own stores, their own dodges, they have their own stuff. They are no worse and no different than earls and dukes and kings who feel that everything belongs to them, and they feel that way because they cannot make anything on their own. They're too stupid and they're too lazy. So. 
don't understand that. It gets really, pretty simple. Does anybody actually believe that this mediocre talent, this incredibly lazy man, whose experience in life has consisted of handing out forms in Chicago, does anybody actually believe that if he had to go out into the free market, into the private sector, that this guy could make enough money to have a private jet and play golf for the rest of his life? Of course not! He's not smart enough to have his own private jet. He's not working hard enough to have his own private jet. He's convinced you that he's helping poor people, and if he really believed it, he'd be down there helping poor people every day. The fact that Barack Obama spent so much time traveling and golfing is an indication that even they know the whole thing's a lie. Of course it's a lie. He's got the biggest private jet in the world. Four engines, and there's another one painted just like it, right behind it in case something happens to the first one. It's for personal money and power. Hillary Clinton, does anybody think Hillary Clinton could live the kind of life where she has never driven a car in 30 years? No! Hillary Clinton could not, Hillary Clinton could not only run, she could not only not run Walmart, she couldn't run a Walmart. She's not smart enough, she doesn't work hard enough. It's just thievery. So here's the last thing I want to say about the poor. And this was done by my friend Dinesh D'Souza, who's really just the best analogy I ever heard. Really enjoyed it. Yes. Who went to prison for making a movie that criticized the president. Yes. Hillary Clinton has violated two federal statutes that require their felonies, and she is walking around free, and, and Dinesh D'Souza has some minor bundling thing. By the way, all of, our, all of our transmissions from the State Department of the United States of America are accessible to anybody in the world now. It's not just criminal, it's treasonous, and everybody knows it. She's walking around, Dinesh D'Souza gets to spend a year in jail, and then when he's released, he has to do another two years of psychotherapy to get this whole freedom thing out of his head. But let's put that aside for a minute. Let's put that aside for a minute. Dinesh D'Souza came up with the most beautiful analogy I've ever heard, and this is what I believe, and this is where we have to go to when they start coming at us with helping the poor thing, okay? Dinesh D'Souza had it completely perfect. He said, let's imagine, just for the sake of simplicity, that the United States of America consists of 100 people. But there's 100 citizens in the country, 100. He said, let's further assume, because it seems to be the case, that of those 100 Americans, 10%, 10 people, are for whatever reason incapable of pulling the cart. They're either very old and infirm and they pulled the cart for years before, or they're very young and they don't have anybody to take care of them, or they have genuine birth defects, or they've got mental problems, or whatever. But it's a reasonable assumption to say that 10 out of these 100 people cannot walk and pull the cart, because they're just not able to. Well, there's not a person alive, certainly not me, and certainly not any of you, who's that, oh, just shoot him in the head, leave him in the ditch. No, of course we can put them in the cart. Easily we can put them in the cart. If we put 10 people in the cart and 90 of us are pulling, we'll not even feel it. We'll barely even know it's there. This is the world we used to live in in America, where we took care of our disadvantaged and our sick people voluntarily. We helped them because we can afford to help them and because we're good people. But what's happening is, now, as we go down the road of life, some guy's got kind of a sore ankle, and maybe he gets in the cart just for a minute or two. Kind of nice in the cart. So maybe I'll stick around for an hour or so. Maybe I'll get in the cart next day tomorrow. Now we've got 89 people and 11 people in the cart, 89 people. And somebody says, that guy with a bad ankle is still in the cart. My knee hurts worse than that guy's ankle. I talked about him a minute ago. He's in the cart. Why the hell should I be in the cart? Now we've got 15 people in the cart. And 85 people pull And then when the real problem happens, ladies and gentlemen, is when you find somebody like the people who we're finding ourselves opposed with, people without any honor or any skill or any decency, start walking down the line of people who are pulling the cart, and they basically say, hey, you know something, buddy? You vote for me, I can get your space on the cart. <laughs> you vote for me, and I'll work it out so that you get to ride the cart. So, boom, into the cart. Where are we now in America? Well, right about now, 50% of the population pays income tax and 50% of the country doesn't. Half of the people are in the cart. Half. 40 of those 50 people don't belong. And now half of us are pulling the other half. And every single day that goes by, more people get in the cart. Now what's going to happen, do you think, when there are 70 people in the cart and 30 people pulling? What do you think is going to happen to those 30 people? They're going to say what any other sensible, decent, smart person is going to say. They're going to say, this is a game now. It's a charade. It's a con game. You're an idiot to be pulling the cart. You're an idiot. When it gets down to 10 people pulling 90 people, no, it's never going to get to 10, 90. It's not going to take that long. When there are 30 people pulling 70 people who don't belong in the cart, the other 30 are going to say, screw it, fine. I'm in, I'm in the cart too. Everybody hops in the cart. 
and then the car doesn't move anymore, and everybody dies. And the tragedy here is that the first people who are going to die are the people who needed the help in the first place. Right? The people that actually needed the help. The people that we were ready to help, the people that we wanted to help, the people that we could help, when there were only 10 of them and 90 of us pulling, they're the ones who are going to suffer the most because they can't go anywhere. They can't go to a new cart. They're the ones that are going to pay. They're going to pay for the laziness and they're going to pay for the, for the, the greed of people that are unwilling to work and want a free ride on your backs. And it's not the poor who are going to benefit, it's the poor who are going to pay. Right? Charity is voluntary. Me making a gun at your head, taking your money to give to somebody else in exchange for voting for me, that's not charity. That's extortion and it's stealing. And as long as we call it that, we're never going to lose another election again. So let's call it that. They're weenies. They're losers. They're lazy and they're stupid. And everybody knows it and nobody says it. Now, I don't have a problem necessarily with laziness. If you want to be a person that doesn't do anything with your life, that's your business. I don't care. But you don't get to tell me that I don't get to do with my life what I want to do with my life. Right. You don't get to tell me. Who do I want? I'm up? I'm finished? I got, one, I got one last thing for you. <laughs> what they'll tell you when they want to bring this, so look, when they want to talk about socialism, wealth redistribution, they have to cover it. They have to have a fig leaf over it, and they have to make it about justice, right? And so what you'll hear in this country all the time today is it's not fair because it's unequal. Some people make more money than other people. That's not equal. It's not right. We just want equality. That's what they say. We just want equality. And they make you argue with equality. But, but, but. There are two different kinds of equality, and they're mutually exclusive. You can't have both at the same time. And this is what we have to understand. We have to be prepared to make this argument. There are two different mutually exclusive forms of equality, and they're both equality. One of them is called equality of opportunity, and the other one's called equality of result. I believe in equality. I believe in equality of opportunity. What does equality of opportunity look like? Equality of opportunity means we take this entire room of people, everybody look around, we take all of us in this room, and we go to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and we get down on the 50-yard line of, of Razorback Stadium, and equality of opportunity means every single person in this room lines up on one goal line, no one gets to start from the 20-yard line, no one gets to start from the 50-yard line, no one has to start from the back of the end zone, no one is held on to. Equality of opportunity means that everybody is freely lined up on that one goal line and I raise my starting pistol, the pistol of life, and I fire that thing and everybody runs the 100 yard dash to the other goal line. Now if I took this room and I set up that experiment, that equality of opportunity, that equality of start experiment, how would people cross the finish line? We cross, and how many people in this room, a couple hundred people, we cross it 200 different times. Because everybody runs faster than everybody else. No two people in this room run at the same speed, right? Is it fair? Well, it is kind of fair, actually. You can run as fast as you can or as slow as you want to. No one's telling you where to run or how to run. If you want to run as fast as you can, you run as fast as you can. But if we take everybody in this room and we start them on the same line and I fire that gun, we're going to cross at different speeds. We're going to end up with different results. But we started from the same equal place. It's equality of opportunity. The left believes in equality of result. The left believes in equality of result, which means everybody has the same house, the same car, the same salary, the same everything. That's what they want. That guy can't have more than me. That's not fair. It's not equal. I just want everybody to be equal. I want everybody to get paid the salary, right? The same salary. So they want everybody to cross the finish line at the same time. This is what socialism is, equality of result. Now, what's the problem with having everybody cross the finish line at the same time? What's the problem? The problem is is that everybody, everybody in this room has to run the race at the speed of the slowest runner. The slowest runner. You cannot run faster than your best speed, right? You can't run faster than you can. That means that either the most disabled or the laziest person in this room, it means that every single other person in this room has to be artificially held back so that they can cross the finish line at the rate of the slowest runner. My kind of a race, everybody is free to run the race of life the way you want to. You run as fast as you want to, if you're motivated, you want to spend some time on the 50-yard line and goof off, that's fine, it's your business, I don't care. 
I consider that to be much more equal and fair because everybody is left alone. Nobody gets a head start, that would be cheating. Nobody would held back, that would be cheating. Quality of opportunity is equality. But they want everybody to cross the finish line at the same time, which means that everybody moves at the speed of the slowest runner, and that means that every single person who's not the slowest runner, which is all of the rest of you, have to be held back. And that's just not really wrong, it's evil. And we should not tolerate evil in this country that was designed for individuals to lead their lives the way they want to and to do as much trade and take as many spears or run as fast or as slow as they choose to. The idea that a guy like Ted Cruz who spent his entire life studying the Constitution or Ben Carson for that matter who's a neurosurgeon, the idea that these two individuals should get the same salary, the same reward, as a guy who spent his entire life out in the back of the 7-Eleven smoking joints is not fair, it's not equal, it's not just, it's not, it's nothing. It's just plain robbery, and it's extortion, and it's stealing, and ultimately it's murder. So, why don't we stop these guys? Alright, let's do it. That's why we're here. Thanks so much for doing that. Thanks again, Bill, for being here with us today. Uh, all of you heard the, earlier the story of the Arkansas Traveler, so I won't rehash that. Um, but I'll just suffice it to say that, obviously in the South, we're known for a little bit of hospitality, and in Arkansas, I think we take great pride in our hospitality, and we want to present you, Bill, um, with an Arkansas Traveler certificate for your, for your um, contributions to this gathering here today. Thank, Thank you so much. much.